I'm Dr. Jim Schultz. Uh, I serve on the board of Oregon Right to Life, and I have the privilege to introduce our speaker for this morning's seminar, What You Don't Know About Death with Dignity Could Kill You. Um, Dr. William Toffler is Professor Emeritus of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University, where he does a wide variety of things, mentors students, um, he engages in delivering babies uh, and palliative care. I mean, it's kind of a wide spectrum of things that he's involved with. He has also co-founded uh, and is the National Director of Physicians for Compassionate Care Education Foundation, where he um, advocates for uh, caring for people uh, with serious illnesses and harm uh, in a, in a life-affirming way, which is kind of a novel thing in the state of Oregon, isn't it? So he has a wide variety of experience. You may have seen him or heard him on NPR, 60 Minutes, Good Morning America, or in any number of other media, both here and overseas. So it's a great privilege to listen to his perspective and expertise about this death with dignity issue. Would you please Join me in welcoming Dr. Toffler this morning. Thanks, Jim. Is there a way to maneuver the slides or just tell you to advance them? How do I handle that? Just tell them? Just tell me. Uh, okay, great. Well, it, it is a privilege to be here, and uh, I think I'm wired up, so I don't need this. Am I correct? Okay, good. So... It is a privilege. I just came from the Catholic Medical Guild meeting uh, this morning, and uh, there are a lot of good news things, and I hope to share some good perspectives in addition to the, the less good perspectives with respect to end-of-life care um, today with, with you. Uh, good perspective, number one, uh, Omicron has uh, actually been a gift from God, I think, in order to get many people immune, and so we're actually having a uh, within a week, this even uh, Dr. Kate Brown has allowed us to not have masks and, and the like. And so for as somebody who actually had, um, had COVID originally uh, over a year ago, and I think I probably got a little cold that was Omicron, uh, we, we, the natural immunity, I think, is the gift from God. And essentially, it's, it's like a vaccine that you didn't have to get with a needle. And it, uh, it's a robust immunity, too. A, a professor, McCary, in... Uh, in Johns Hopkins University, basically did a 20 months or did a study and showed that your immunity, if you got a natural immunity, lasts 20, 20 months. So it is actually superior, and I think that's what's causing everything to go away. It is not, in my opinion, masking and, and quarantining and the like. It's simply that we got a, a, a real gift with this latest variant that's not quite so virulent. That was one good thing that we shared this morning. The other thing, too, is that uh, you don't realize the impact that you have, each one of you. And, and I was reminded of that this morning as some young doctor in internal medicine came up to me and she said, I heard you on the Doctor Doctor podcast, which is put on uh, every week by Tom McGovern and some other uh, individuals within the Catholic Medical Association. And that's why she was there. So I just want to remind you the power you each have in sharing what you learned today and what you gain today with people in a gentle, loving perspective. And so you can go to the next slide and I'll cover what I'm actually supposed to talk about. So I wanna first just give you a brief overview of where we are and general in the world and also here in Oregon. As all of you know, I think that are Oregonians, this was where the madness of the solution to suffering at the end of life is the end of life of the sufferer started right here in Oregon. And I'll just cover a little bit briefly why that happened, but, um, but this is the epicenter. And the good news is that, as I'll show you in a few slides, it, it is not the domino effect that was predicted, and we have the majority of states still very much opposed. In fact, they've strengthened laws against them. I'm gonna share some of those details. I'm going to share some of the diabolical features of this, too, because a lot of people think, just like they wasn't, was uh, a spouse in the beginning, that this is like Hollywood. You just take a pill and you go off to sleep. And the reality is that it's not that at all. And I'm going to show uh, the unethical experimentation that's being done, not on guinea pigs, not on animals, but on, on humans. And so... Uh, it's, I think, important to know the details because lots of people think this is just a, um, a so-called compassionate end of life, and it really is not. Uh, 
The unethical research that's being done is by a man, it's Lonnie Shavelson down in California. I'll give you some of those details and uh, why this is a dangerous phenomenon. So, next slide. So, it is a layout in two dimensions of the world, which is round, of course, but the blue areas are showing where you have uh, assisted suicide contaminating um, the end-of-life paradigm. It's actually blue wherever assisted suicide or euthanasia, because if you look at the largest landmass there, it's Canada. And that was implemented in Canada by a Supreme Court decision that was reversal of a previous Supreme Court decision that Canada made 20 years earlier, 5-4. They, they didn't find any constitutional right. And somehow within 20 years, nine did nothing. The Supreme Court of Canada actually not only... Uh, found a right to life, I mean, a right to kill yourself at the end of life under the penumbra of the right to life in their Canadian constitution. You can't make this up. That's what they said. So they also had looked at Oregon, and unlike a lot of things that you see in the news where this is a great model here in Oregon, they realized that it really wasn't that great and that there were lingering deaths, that um, the dress weren't pretty, that the cocktail that you would take would be bitter and alkaline. And they literally decided, well, if we're going to do this, we ought to do it efficiently. And so all but two deaths in Canada are by euthanasia. Now, the euthanasia is identical to what goes on with death row. And now, I'm not here to debate the wisdom or lack of wisdom of the death penalty, but the punishment for people who are found to be guilty of a capital crime is to get, get three drugs. One of the drugs would be a, a relaxant, anti-anxiety. Uh, next thing would be to put the person to sleep. And the last thing would be give the person muscle paralyzing agents. That's if you were to do it by injection, death by injection. Those are exactly the same three drugs that Canada's giving and having doctors um, give to give compassionate care at the end of life. So it's, it's absolutely uh, turning yourself into a pretzel to say that this is so-called compassionate care. Now, the title, as you saw, I have the so-called or the, in quotes, death with dignity. And it's important to realize as a principle that whenever you see one of these euphemisms, don't use it without saying so-called, or at least put it in quotes if you're writing about it, because otherwise what you're doing is you're carrying uh, the, the water for the devil, so to speak. You know, you're, you're promoting the concept, which is actually false. Bernard Nathanson, who was the founder of abortion, uh, literally he toppled a 158-year-old New York state law, having decided that abortion was being done poorly in the state of New York. And they managed to topple that law with a lot of um, lies and distortions about what really was, was happening. But he said, all, all, social, uh, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. All social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. So you've got to not use these terms that are absolutely covering up, masking, putting veneer on something that's really bad and distorted and for those of us who have faith it's evil it's it's diabolical to think that the solution to suffering is the end of life of the sufferer so never use these words they so-called medical aid in dying well i'm i'm for aiding the dying so you see what is important never use those terms and if you take nothing else away from this don't let them use the language don't let social engineering um, be preceded by verbal engineering next So the status in the United States is, um, is from week to week. Uh, just this morning, I found out that Connecticut had kicked a so-called right-to-die bill out of their judicial committee, where it had bottled it up before. And so it's going to go out to the state legislature. And this is one of the ways that you um, push this and promote it in a society. In Oregon, of course, it was a ballot measure where they sold it to us is a passive thing where you just take a pill and you slip off to death. Uh, so you have bills to legalize it in 2021 in multiple states. You see Massachusetts, Delaware, Minnesota, New York, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Uh, this year, there are a whole other half dozen or so states that are trying to legalize uh, physician-assisted suicide. That's, that's actually the king's English. 
they're legalizing, empowering me or doctors in those states to end someone's life. That's a lot of power to put in the hands of the doctor. It's not something that is, the power is not in the patient. This is the, the lie of this whole thing. So they also want to expand assisted suicide, just as it's already expanded here in the state of Oregon. Many of you may know that there used to be a 15-day waiting period. How long is the waiting period now? It's one day. If you think the person's dying quickly, we've, first we've got, to, we've got to assist them in suicide before they die naturally. This is uh, the, the pressure. It's, a, it's amazing. But that, they also wanted in Oregon to actually pass a uh, law saying that the word ingest would actually mean that you could shoot up a drug or you could put it in rectally. And so ingest now would mean what it doesn't mean in the King's English. And that was actually being opposed by both sides. You sort of say, well, I understand why Dr. Toffer might not be in favor of this. This is expanding this. This is going beyond the passive act of letting a patient take their own deadly cocktail. That, why would the other side be opposed to it? Well, the reason is because they're trying to pass it in all these states. And one of the more strongest arguments against these um, bills is that they're not circumscribed. They're going to expand. Canada was ingenuous, I guess, if you will, not disingenuous, when they actually said, well, if we're going to do this, let's do it efficiently. And let's give every doctor the kit with these three medications. And by the way, a backup kit in case the first three are unsuccessful because even with injection, there are failures, just as there are with the capital punishment, with electrocution or with injection, there are failures. And so even though it's much more secure to do that than with the oral overdoses. So this is the hope I put in red here. In 2022 so far, none have passed and none of these proposals were passing last year either. And in fact, they're four states that want to strengthen the penalties for engaging in assisted suicide. So the other point I'd like to leave you with is that there is nothing inevitable about this. I can't predict the future. I didn't have a training in crystal ball reading in medical school or residency. And so just as I can't tell you exactly how many months you have to live, I, I can't also predict which way this is going. A lot of it depends on us of what do we do? How do we articulate this? Do we just be so-called neutral. Well, you, you can't be neutral about this topic. Being neutral is like being neutral on slavery. It's like being neutral on wife beating, child abuse, a neutral about a country with mechanized tanks, infantry, bombs, planes, going and just taking and land grabbing another country. You know, I don't know what led up to that. I'm not an expert on Ukraine, Russian politics. I've read a lot on both sides at this point. But no matter what happened before, it's not okay to go shelling individual places with residents and children that are not combatants. So regardless of what you think about anything about why it came, who made what, what mistake, and there are a lot of them along the way, particularly with the current um, administration. I was going to say leadership, but that is actually inappropriate. <laughs> Next slide. So... I just want to give you hope. These are bills that were defeated last year in multiple states because people have educated themselves about it. They do not let others get away with saying that everything is going swimmingly in Oregon. It is not. It has not. And I'm going to give you why there's desperate research trying to figure out deadly cocktails because they can't make the leap to go where Canada is, which was honest about if you're going to do this, do it efficiently. Um, they can't do that. And at the same time, it's not very pretty taking an overdose. How, how many of you have ever been in or worked in an emergency room where there were overdoses? But there's a few of you. How many of those were pretty? None. I mean, I, I remember people taking one of these drugs on her own to kill herself, one of the drugs that are in the new cocktail, amitriptyline. And she was in the ICU for three days. She blew up like a balloon, and it was nip and tuck as whether she live or not. It was not something that was so-called death with dignity. It was not compassionate. And so people are not being told the truth about this. So this is hopeful because there's at least, uh, you know, nine, ten states up there where these bills were voted out or they were just died in committee or whatever else. And that's because people have been 
educated. At one time, you know, I'd be invited all over the place to talk about this, and there are many people who are actually keeping up with it better than I have. I've been at it now, I just thought about it this morning, for 28 years since 1994 of trying to push back against this. And the good news is it was bottled up here in Oregon for 11 years before it spread to Washington. And then there's a few states, maybe we're talking about 10 out of 40, and the District of Columbia, where this has been legalized. And uh, in one state, Montana, it's not really legal there, it's just that there's a defense if you did this act, and it's not against the Montana state constitution. Next slide. So in Oregon, this is the latest data. Uh, the, the Oregon Health Authority is the one that publishes this. This is all secondhand reports or even third-hand reports, because the doctor is not present 85% of the time when this overdose is taken. So you're depending on second- and third-hand people to give the data that then is given to the Oregon Health Division, who collates it and is supposed to give out an annual report. They're late this year. It makes me wonder why, because there's so many bills pending. Maybe the report shows the inevitable rise, the gap between people who are given the dose and then don't take it, like you see between the lower line, which are the actual deaths, and the upper line, which is the actual prescriptions written. What happens to those prescriptions after they're not taken? We don't know. Nobody's tracking anything with this. And then the data that's given to the Oregon Health Division is actually destroyed, actively destroyed. It's the only place in medicine where I know where they actively destroy records. So... If you had 2021 on there, it would probably be up higher again in both categories. There's nothing that would make me think it's lower. This has got implications as well for suicide in general. The non-assisted suicide rate in the country has gone up, down, or stayed the same. It's gone up. And part of that are drugs taken inadvertently. Part of it is invertly. They know what they're doing. And the reason why they want to end their lives has to do with lots of different issues, one of which is the the shutdown of the economy. One of it is the drugs coming across the border that are laced with fentanyl, a thousand times more powerful per unit dose than morphine. And so you've got people who are in them being addicted to drugs. You have, by the way, you know, you talk about us being blind and not transparent to evil. The drugs are coming through Mexico, but where do they come from? China. You know, we're buying fuel right now from Russia at the same time, we're putting quarantine down on them, and, and the current administration actually thinks it's better to worry about something 100 years out, the so-called climate change, the so-called global warming, than to give billions of dollars to the person who's destroying Sylvian's innocent life in the Ukraine. It, it's just nuts. And so here we are with an epidemic of suicides, driven in part because if you say suicide is death with dignity. You have fooled a lot of people in thinking this is virtuous. This is something that's good. And if you don't think that contaminates society, um, I think you're naive. We've taught people that this is death with dignity. And so if a young person in their teens or 20s sees that this is labeled with these euphemisms, how can they not think that this is a righteous thing to do? Next slide. So um, this is just to highlight one of my former colleagues who was the head of medical oncology, I think at one time. Now he's just a professor of medical oncology. And he boasted when he was testifying in front of the, the committee trying to decide whether or not the word ingest would include IVs and all. And Dr. Charles Blank, he boasted that he'd done, I think, over 100 at the time. He does 15%. One doctor does 15% of the assisted suicides in the state of Oregon. One doctor, so much for a personal relationship with your doctor who knows you well and knows that this is the right choice because you really are terminal. And of course, is anybody in the room right here not terminal? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you just can't make this up. I mean, the power that's in, involved in this uh, man, Dr. Charles Blank, and his lack of insight into the inherent conflict of interest of being a medical oncologist where if I had a cancer, I would go to an oncologist, not this one, who would basically, I want to help me live well until I die naturally of my cancer, if it's that lethal cancer, just as happened with my late wife who passed away about eight years ago 
Uh, we went to the oncologist. We went to everybody that could help to try to extend and have her live well until she died naturally. She died with dignity at home. All of those words that are corrupted happened with my own lived experience with my late wife. And we, every one of those days was precious. You know, sure, there were hard times. Sure, it was difficult and suffering at times. She had a spinal fracture from a metastatic lesion. And we gave her palliative surgery. She was able then two months to go and see her, our youngest son graduate from the University of Dallas. It's very special. Do you think you're going to have palliative surgery when we've got rid of um, the, the need of trying to help people? And rather than that, we're just going to predict you're going to be dead in three to nine months. Again, there's no science behind such predictions. And then we're going to stop doing things that would extend your life because they're costly. This is the utilitarian logic that many of my colleagues have embraced. So the reality is this is very dangerous. What you don't know about this whole paradigm, it can affect you. You cannot be neutral about it. And if you are, you're allowing uh, the utilitarians to take over. It's like essentially uh, the inmates have taken over the asylum. You've got to be involved. And that's what we said to the young doctors today at the Catholic Medical Guild meeting. That's what the whole theme of the meeting. Um, so hospice involvement used to be clean. Hospice was essentially in the image of Dame Cicely Saunders, who probably got the techniques from the Christian Catholic nuns in England before her, where again, her whole goal was to extend life. And hospice shouldn't be a bad word, unfortunately. Originally, they wouldn't be involved in going into the house. Now they do. So you cannot be part of this. And if you are, you're enabling it. You're saying, okay, I wouldn't do it for me, but if you want to end your life, let me help you. Essentially, it's vending machine medicine, if you will. Next. So when you take overdoses, just as I alluded to with emergency room overdoses, and that's not a pretty sight, and there can be lingering deaths. There was a David Pruitt, who I believe he lived out in the Gresham area, and he took the cocktail of the time, he went to sleep. He woke up 67 hours later, and I'm quoting. This is a quote. Uh, what the hell happened? I thought I was supposed to be dead. His wife, who'd gone passively along with his notion, basically was kind of glad he was still with us, and he lived another 11 days. And then just as my wife did, he died of the cancer or complications of the cancer 11 days later with dignity without taking a massive overdose. Oh, he didn't take another one at the point. In fact, he actually had an epiphany thinking about why the bad things happened to some team. He had an epiphany, well, God must not want me to be gone. And this is all written up in the Oregonian. You can go back in the files and look at it. It was two-page spread. It's one of the few times where a glimpse of the truth leaked out into the public where you actually know what's going on behind the closed doors. So, next slide. So Derek Humphrey is, is somebody who has actually been a, for this since the 80s when he wrote uh, a book, you know, Final Exit, which was very popular. And he wrote another book, Lawful Exit, for his disciples. And I read the book and I debated him at PSU years ago at Lincoln Hall shortly after this law passed in Oregon where the ballot measure was uh, accepted. And basically, uh, chapter six, I'll never forget, it was double, called Double Speak of how do you... How do you confuse the people with different terms so that they go along with what you're saying? And, and I, I pulled out the paper because I just made a Xerox copy and said, you know, Derek, I, I, speaking of double effect, because we were talking about double effect, that's the principle where you don't intend for somebody to die. You're trying to treat their pain. And a side effect was that you have the person's respiration quiet down. And, and that actually happens to be the time that they pass away. That's called double effect. It's not unethical. You weren't trying to kill the person. It's a side effect. Just like if I give somebody penicillin and they have an anaphylactic reaction, that's a double effect as well. And I'm not trying to make it happen. So it's ethical to give penicillin. It's ethical to give morphine for pain. And in fact, the data shows that if you do it judiciously, you live longer and more comfortably. That's a fact. But at any rate, the double effect was the conversation right before. I said, well, speaking of double, why do you have a chapter dedicated to how to teach your disciples how to fool people. I mean, and he turned red and a uh, few shades and all that. It was an effective moment in the debate. He actually is easy to debate because he's ingenuous. He tells it like it is. He, he actually doesn't want me to have to be forced to refer people, even if I'm opposed to it. 
which is an important principle. So at least in some ways, he's not trying to impose his will, but many of his disciples are. And I know just a month ago, I was on a Congress of Delegates meeting for the American Academy of Family Physicians. This is a 135,000 member organization of family doctors like myself. And they're trying to do things like strip away the Hyde Amendment. They're trying to actually make sure that people have to do things that they don't want to do or else refer. Now, think about that. The simplest analogy I can make is you didn't rob the bank, but you did drive the person there and you knew he was going to rob the bank. Are you culpable? Yeah, you're an accomplice. So for those of us who've reasoned through this, referring for something you know is against your conscience and from your point of view is unethical, immoral, is not what we should be doing. We, you want doctors that are going to be straightforward with what they do and they don't do, and they won't help you to do what they think is not in your good interest. You want a doctor like that, don't you? Yeah. So... It's, it's astonishing. Now, interesting enough, one of my colleagues or one of the people on the 200-person Zoom team meeting, whatever we were doing, they said, well, you know, people come to me for ivermectin, and I don't want to give it ivermectin. I don't want to have to refer them to somebody with ivermectin. And I thought, hmm, there you go. You see how this comes back to bite them when indeed, you know, I look at ivermectin as it won't do harm. I've given it probably to 70 different people over, over time. And, you know, I give them... a prognosis, alternatives, risk, questions, discussion. And if it's something that's useful, now you're seeing states turn around where they're saying, you know, it's not, it's not inappropriate to do things that are off-label. In fact, 20% of the doctors, 20% of the drugs in the United States today are being used off-label. So that's, that's, it's astonishing to me. And so it's, a, it's one of those kind of things where I have colleagues who don't have any problem seeing that they shouldn't be forced to refer for something they don't believe in, even when it's not even an ethical thing in a sense of a morality. This is just simply, in their prudent judgment, they don't think they should prescribe this. Fine. But um, I, I respect that, by the way. Or a pharmacist doesn't fill it. I don't agree with them, but the point is, you see what I'm saying? I'd like people to be able to have physician autonomy as well as patient autonomy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so um, when... Talking about the David Pruitt case, this is a quote from Derek Humphrey about this issue. Doctors prescribing not there at the death, that's a problem. It's a miserable path to death. This is the guy who actually was the chief architect for passing assisted suicide in the state of Oregon. They tried in California, Washington, lost both of those states 54 to 46, and they barely passed it in 1994, 50 to 49. He says, the doctor should be able to give a lethal injection. Again, he's like the Canadians trying to be efficient. Lingering death could be up to two days. That's true. In fact, it's longer than two days. It was 65, 67 hours. So he shared a case of a man still alive at seven hours. His father then took a pillow and smothered him, which is why basically even Derek Humphrey realizes this is lousy. This is a way to get the camel's nose under the tent. And once that happens, you can do what they're doing or trying to do, shorten a waiting period, expand the meaning of the word ingest, and ultimately get to the efficient way like the Canadians have done with now over 10,000 people in the country of Canada. Two and a half percent of the population now dies by euthanasia. Next slide. So why do we uh, swallow these, uh, this pill? Why do we do it? Well, we've talked about the euphemisms. Uh, the perception is, look, nobody's making them do it. The person's asking for it. Uh, it's perceived as a passive act for the doctor. I didn't really end their life. I just gave them means to do it. I just drove them to the bank. In the Hollywood image is that you just take a pill and you slip off to sleep peacefully, kind of like, you know, these suicide pills, I guess, that, you know, special agents, KGB, use. In, in movies, at least, I have no idea if that's what goes on in real life. Next slide. So before I get to this man, Lonnie Shavelson, I, I, I do want to say that what uh, was on that previous slide, go back one slide for me a second here, if you could. So um, the individual is not in control. In the places in the world where this has been the, the most used, even if it was illegal up until 2002, the Netherlands, they have over 1,000 people every year whose lives are ended without ever asking for it. 1,000 people. In fact, they have a term for it. It's called LWERP. End of life without explicit request or permission. LWERP. They actually categorize the term. When you ask these doctors, 
anonymously because they won't talk otherwise, but you have an anonymous survey by the government called the Remlick Report. Why would you do that? Why would you end the life of somebody without them asking for it, which is supposedly the safeguard? Well, I knew they were going to die in a week anyhow. I just needed the bed. Or there was a nun who also had a terminal illness like all of us do. And uh, he said, um, you know, I, I didn't bring it up with her because I knew it was against her faith. She's Catholic and uh, that's not something you do if you're a practicing uh, Catholic, striving to live according to God's guidelines. And so um, I didn't bring it up with her because I knew she would not go along with it. So who's got the autonomy and who's got the control? Next slide. Well, it's actually this guy. He's the one that's doing the most research on what's the deadly cocktail that we can use because he recognizes just what I recognize, just what Derek Humphrey recognizes. It's not very good. In fact, the cost went up as well. So he'd actually set up a clinic. As soon as it passed in California, he had a clinic in San Francisco offering uh, out of his kind of his heart to kill somebody for $2,000. That was back then. This is now like you know, 20 years ago or 10, 10 15 years ago. So uh, $2,000 is worth more than it was worth um, or it's worth more at that time than now. So he's, he's not necessarily doing this altruistically, although he has a passion for this issue. So he's done all the, a lot of the research. He's one of the leaders. You can see him there, and you can see the slide barely there. It's got these margins. I'll actually show you a blow-up of that slide next, if you would. So part of why he was driven to try to do this work is that he, like Derek Humphrey, saw how absolutely misguided this was in real life if you're actually there at the scene when this is going on. So he has a book called The Chosen Death. He describes watching a hemlock society leader. And by the way, that was the term for what is now so-called compassion and choices was the hemlock society. I don't have to say so-called with that because it, it actually conjures up the reality of hemlock was the poison that Socrates drank. You know, this is the deadly poison. So it was actually talking pretty clean, plainly about what they're up to. So Sarah was the name of the leader. Uh, he, she was helping a disabled man who wanted to be dead, Gene, to ch and, um, and murdered this person because Gene changes his mind. This is the description in his book of this. Shavelson was in Gene's home by invitation as Sarah's hands, uh, hands Gene a poisonous brew. She you know, very lightly says, okay, toots, here you go. Like this is uh, no big deal. Gene drank the liquid and began to fall asleep as Sarah put a plastic bag over his head. Next slide. Suddenly, faced with the prospect of immediate death, Gene screamed, I'm cold, and tried to rip the bag off his face, but Sarah wouldn't allow it. His good hand flew up to tear off the plastic bag. Sarah's hand caught Gene's wrist and held it. His body thrust up her. She pulled his arm away and lay across Gene's shoulders. Sarah rocked back and forth, pinning him down, her fingers twisting the bag to seal it tight as his neck as she repeated, the light, Gene, go toward the light. Gene's body pushed against Sarah. Then he stopped moving. So much for so-called compassionate care. This is killing. Next slide. Somebody changes their mind. I thought they were about choice. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if you know this, but there's a bill before the legislature. I, I, it's, um, it's astonishing. Another piece of good news. I've been part of the abortion reversal network for about a decade, started by a family physician like myself down in Southern California, and he and other person published a series of six cases showing that if you gave people taking Mifepristone, the RU46, uh, large doses of progesterone, you could actually overwhelm the blocking effect of this deadly chemical abortion. So we've saved over now over 2,500 as of fall at the Catholic Medical Association meeting in Florida and probably up to 3,000 now, of a network of nurses who are volunteers all over the country, just like their doctors like me, who volunteer to take these phone calls 24-7. So somebody takes the pill, and they are almost like somebody jumping off the bridge saying, what did I just do? And they change their mind, and so they find us. That's amazing, because they don't hear it from the emergency room doctors. They don't say, oh, well, contact this network. They can, they can help you with this. No, they say there's nothing you can do. And that's what they say at Planned Parenthood as well. So the bottom line is that we have the ability to be pro-choice even with people who make a mistake and change their mind. And so we're the pro-choice. We're really choosing life and we're for people being able to change their mind when they make a mistake. 
we're trying to follow Jesus who said we need to infinitely forgive people, not seven times, seven times, seven, 70, 70 times seven. So I already mentioned there's no tracking. Uh, lethal medications are not in, 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 ingested. They vomit them, that sort of thing. Uh, the ulterior motives, life insurance. I mean, I've never asked a patient, what life insurance do you have and who stands to benefit from your death? But in a culture like today, I wonder if I should be asking that question. What's the ulterior motive there? And then there are health cost pressures. And Barbara Wagner, as many of you know, was right here in Oregon. She was a school bus driver in Salem. She had a cancer. It was quiescent. It came back. And then she and her oncologist both wanted to get a drug called Tarceva. Tarceva would not be curative any more than the drugs, the six or seven drugs that my late wife Marlene took. But they could extend life or at least you'd hope for that. And it would give her a 46% increased chance of being alive in one year. It cost about $4,000 a month. The Oregon Health Authority gave her a letter, and in the letter she said, we won't pay for that drug because it's too expensive, but we will pay for pain relief and palliative care, and that's line 265 on their 550 or so items that they covered at the time. So she gets the letter and she says, well, who are these people? What right do they say I can, in the same letter, I can give you assisted suicide, but I won't pay for something that might extend my life. And so this was at least with two people that leaked out. There was a Eugene Mann and Barbara Wagner. Who knows how many other people got this same letter, cold calcul calculating utilitarian letter. And that's the problem with PAS uh, is that people are given up on and what research is going to be done when the person's no longer there and think about a different model HIV up until 1995 HIV was hundred percent fatal why is it not fatal now in fact it was so dismal that of a hundred infectious disease doctors in San Francisco in the mid 90s 50 percent of those doctors admitted they'd help to kill somebody with HIV 50% of the doctors are infectious disease. So what research could you do if you have dead patients? You know, Well, they did research in spite of those doctors and the hopelessness that they felt and projected on their patients, and they came up with heart therapy, highly effective antiretroviral therapy. And now those people that were d dead couldn't avail themselves of it because they had been with a doctor who colluded with their feeling of despondency and desperateness. So look at what we're missing by going this, down this paradigm. Next slide. So the drugs are problematic because they're nausea, vomiting, they cause, they're bitterly alkaline, they can burn your, your esophagus as it goes down, so they come up with all kinds of things. And then the cost I mentioned, originally, cecobarbital, which was the favorite, you took a 90 to 100 of them, and then most people would die with that kind of level of toxicity. Um, but the cost went up to 3,600, next slide. And um, that's where we are now. But the, the drugs are so difficult to swallow, they, they have learned that they need to give a very potent antiemetic, a Nancitron or Zofran met medical pride, uh, which is a bowel motility agent to keep things moving. And you gotta take it about an hour before. And then the Sika Barbital is, um, if you had it, you could consume it in two to three minutes. You don't have it now because it's so expensive. And then the other thing that, um, why is it not available? Well, it's sold for pennies, literally, per pill. Uh, and it's old drug. It's almost 90 years old. Well, some drug company bought it. There was no generic equivalent, and they immediately raised the price, just making a profit and that sort of thing. Maybe it was also motivated by they don't want to sell it for assisted suicide. I don't know, but it's not used. It's, um, it's part of the capitalistic culture where you have this. Now, this is driven, next slide, to looking at other options. And so they've, Dr. Shavelson in San Francisco and some other colleagues in Washington, Vermont, Oregon, Montana, have done their own research, not being approved by human subject review committees, not being done with animals first. And so it's uh, Ackerman, or the, the, uh, the initials are DDMP1, that was the first one. Now, these doses are somewhere between 100 and 400 times the appropriate dose that you'd give for digoxin. I'll give you an example of that. Digoxin would be normally given 0 0.125, 0 0.25, and we're talking about 25 or even 50 milligrams of digoxin. And with this new cocktail, they're studying how long does it take for the person to fall asleep and to die. And even then you have lingering deaths up to 
um, seven and a half hours with this uh, appropriate approach. But think of this, these are not drugs that you're giving for the health and well-being of somebody. This is drugs that you're deliberately giving to kill the person and experimenting with different people. Are these people being told that we're, we're trying this new cocktail and this is what we're doing? Are they being told that they don't have to do this, that we, we, we aren't doing it on animals first? Um, no, I don't think they're being told any of this. Are, are they being told they're a research subject in his study, that, his so-called study that he's doing? No. Next slide. So they've discovered recently, I mentioned my personal experience when I was a physician in Sweet Home, Oregon, of a person who was depressed and took a massive dose of am amitriptyline. So now they know amitriptyline is really lethal. And so they've substituted the amitriptyline for the P, which was propranolol. And that is one of the ways they've modified this to make it even more deadly. They'll give this actually way in advance because it's not as noxious. So their person's really, by the time they take it, it's an hour later and it's such a massive dose, it makes what my patient took look like child's play they're gonna be dead. It's just a matter of time. And will that time be compassionate, loving, uh, beautiful death? Uh, not necessarily, next slide. So the Oregon Health Department has tracked this and you can see back in 2013, you, most of these things were Cicobarbital and it rose to um, over 100 prescriptions by 2015. You can see almost no Cicobarbital, the rapid acting barbiturate because of the cost. And then you start seeing these other ones, the DDMA, that's the digoxin, diazepam, morphine, and amitriptyline. And then Dr. Lonnie has his own little cocktail, which is basically the DDMA, and he's adding some phenobarb into it. And so that's the experiment. And this is all published. I'm giving you the latest data. This is looking at um, what was published a year ago. And again, as I said, it didn't come out in February. I was hoping it'd get out, but it's, as of today, it's not out of what's happening. And you'd see, if you would, probably everything would be going up that has to do with these new cocktails and none of the old cocktails. Next. So this is actually the, the doses, morphine's 15 grams, diazepam's one gram. The, again, these are, these are things you, you might give somebody two milligrams of these things, one milligram. Propranolol, I might give somebody 10 milligrams, 25, 50. So one thousandth of the dose is the point. Digoxin, now they're up to 100 milligrams. This, these are incredibly lethal, deliberately killing people. It's almost, think back to the dark side of the last the 20th century when they were experimenting how to efficiently kill Jewish people in various ways um, by the, 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 the Nazi regime. And then, you know, the cost of this is now uh, about six or $700. Next slide. And they have special compounding pharmacies that they are colluding with to do this. This is the data that we, you saw on the computer screen of Lonnie Shavelson. So he's got the time of death down to a median of 43 minutes. The range is anywhere from nine minutes to nine hours. And you see the great variation in the bars there in terms of time to death. And it's, um, so even with their experimentation, this is not something that you can say is going to be like the Canadian experience, where at least they're upfront about how they're going about this. But they're having to do this because of people like me and you, hopefully, pushing back against this and saying, this is, this is wrong. It's not, uh, not going swimmingly in Oregon. These overdoses are noxious. Uh, they're difficult to tolerate, no matter what they do ahead of time uh, with the ways to prevent nausea and vomiting. Next slide. So we still have the problem with lingering deaths. They do occur, death with dignity, the so-called phrase by overdoses and what's sold. And oversight's missing as we're physicians, um, as our physicians at the time of death. This is it, if you actually believe in this and you care about your patient, um, why would you not be there at the most important time, birth and death, uh, if you care about them, you know? Um, there's huge abuse. There have already been cases where somebody did want the person dead so they could get the house and get the bank accounts, even though they were supposed to be guardians and follow his will. That didn't happen. She was only caught, by the way, not because of this. It was because of other things that she'd done nefariously as a real estate person over in Bend. Much like Governor Cuomo wasn't really punished for having put people into the nursing homes with a deadly virus, uh, he did it because there was a different scandal with women having been abused by him in the workplace. So next slide. Um, so the experimentation, as I said, violates every principle of the Nuremberg Code, and these are some of them. 
Uh, you're supposed to have social and clinical value. Well, killing people doesn't have a value any more than what Putin's doing in Ukraine right now. There's no scientific validity to it. Never went through human subject review. There's no double blind prospective studies. Uh, there's no subject selection criteria. Uh, there should be a risk benefit ratio that's favorable. And when you're talking about you're trying to kill people, how would you even calculate such a thing? There's no independent review. These are all people, rogue doctors. There are, by the way, there are, I think, 14,000 practicing physicians in the state of Oregon. There are about 200 that are engaged in this paradigm. Some of them are national figures, like one of my former colleagues, who's now petitioning so that people out of state can be ended, have their lives ended with his prescriptions. There's no informed consent about the fact that these are experimental things they're doing with these people, and uh, there is no real respect for these people who are enrolled. Next slide. So you're supposed to have voluntary consent for these things. They're not even told this is an experimental. The fruitful is results for society, as I said, it's actually the opposite. Just like if we'd done this and never tried to come up with a cure for HIV, there wouldn't be one right now if the solution to this was to encourage them just to end their lives. Um, the results of animal experimentation has never been done with this. Um, by the way, you know, one of the more effective things, I think, from a secular point of view is, is uh, an argument that I think carries great weight I've never heard a good response to, is simply that if you're going to do this in society, if you believe society believes this is a good paradigm, you shouldn't have doctors doing it. We have no special training. Up until recently, they've actually formed a society for these death doctors, essentially, to teach these techniques. When I was at OHSU, for the first time in my residency program, they actually had a session on how to, if you will, for an entire afternoon with no counterpoint. Uh, I demanded a counterpoint and got it the next week or two, but that was not very helpful for the people who couldn't come to both seminars. And so you only got one point of view. This is happening now where they're teaching this technique and actually saying people have to be involved. All the doctors in Canada have to refer for this. They don't just transfer care. They actually have to refer to somebody they know will do this. And that's how doctor autonomy has been taken away. So experiments should be conducted to avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering and injury. And indeed, they're trying to get people to die quickly without the long lingering suffering and all that. But it's, again, not gone through human subjects. No experiment should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury would occur. Well, it's inherently doing that. This is the goal. So it violates virtually every principle in the urban code. Next. Um, it should never exceed the risk. And, of course, the risk is death here, and that's what they want. That's actually success. Um, you should have preparations to protect people. It's not happening. You should have scientifically qualified persons. I don't know that Shavelson's ever done any research before the research that he's doing now, and he's certainly not getting advice or review by people who are dispassionate scientists. During the course of the experiment, the human subject should be at liberty to bring the experiment to an end. You saw what happened when somebody changed their mind with the mentality of the people uh, here. So it's violating everything. Next slide. So this is the other thing I think is important for us as public to put pressure on. Why are insurance companies paying for this? So it's not just the doctor. You have Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Health Net, Kaiser, Medi-Cal, United are all doing this. The only people that are not culpable that I can find are the VA system and Medicare is not covering this at the moment. But if you don't push back as a public, as, uh, we will actually have them embrace it as a a right, a so-called right to die. Again, euphemism. Does anybody in the room here not have a right to die? I mean, think how silly this is. Next slide. So the research is dispassionate care. It's not compassionate. Compassionate means to be willing to suffer with the patient. Dispassionate means whether you live or die is your choice. It's... I. I have no emotional investment in what decision you make. And this is dangerous because I've had people express suicidal thoughts, whether they're terminal or not. And my universal approach to that is to say, gosh, tell me about that. 
You must be hurting. And hear the story. And just by listening to people, that's therapeutic by itself without solving anything. I mean, think about this, especially to the men here. When you listen to your wife, um, do you have to solve her problems? No, she's going to kill you if she's trying to solve her problems. You just listen to them, and that's therapeutic because nobody, they feel isolated and alone. So just starting that, when I do hear something, then I can be like Mother Angelica, who was a great example of somebody coming in with a tragic story. And because she'd had so many tragedies in her life, she could say something honestly. I know how hard that is. And then she would top that story sometimes with her own lived experience of suffering, of having her father abandon the home, her mother being an overwhelmed single parent. And it was therapeutic because they made the person not feel alone. And there is life after the suffering you're going through. I've listened to her over and over again. How did she be so affected? How did this crippled nun be so effective with people not sight and seed? It's, it's a wonderful model. If you've never seen anything, a little snippet, do a download and look at what she did when people would call in. Um, but you have to do that with people. You cannot get caught up in, well, this is horrible. I don't blame you. I'd, I'd want to kill myself too. This is not therapeutic. This is colluding with desperateness. This is actually, to me, malpractice. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so I, I wanted to give you an overview of, of how we should behave in a culture that maybe doesn't embrace all of the principles of all human life is inherently valuable. From a religious point of view, all human life is sacred at all its stages. Is there anybody here who doesn't believe that? I see no hands. But if I were to say this in a secular audience, if I were to say this back at OHSU when I was there before I became an emeritus faculty and persona non grata because I would tell people the truth about birth control, um, which is actually a good thing. I wanted to share hope. I wouldn't have started with my colleagues, Holy Family Catholic Clinic, a year and a half ago. Two years ago, we planned it without having the difficulty that I went through with not being accepted, not having my diversity honored at OHSU. So I want to give you hope that no matter what happens, that's really a good thing. I mean, I even heard today on, on the Catholic radio station that why sin has a silver lining. How can you be redeemed if you don't sin? You know, how can Jesus work wonders? He came for the sinners. That was the gospel just this week. The well don't need a physician. So we have to have that behavior with everybody. And probably the best example of, of this lived reality was my colleague, Ken Stevens. He's a retired chairman of the radiation oncology department at OHSU. So he had Jen Hall, Jeanette Hall come to him. She had voted for assisted suicide. She was found to have irresectable colorectal cancer. So she comes in and she says, Dr. Stevens, I'm not here for the... I'm not here for radiation therapy, chemotherapy. I, I'm here for the pills. I voted for assisted suicide, and I, I'm, I'm just here for the pills. And instead of being a vending machine, Dr. Stevens said, well, um, tell me a little bit about that, and tell me about your family. He finds out that she has a son who's in a police academy. He's not married. He just planted some seeds to a fellow human traveler. He said, well, don't you want to see him graduate? Don't you want to see him get married? She went home and thought about it. The next week she comes back, I, I think I want to go through the treatment. She was desperately afraid her hair would fall out. He said, well, you know, it, it'll grow back and, uh, and convinced her to go through with her change of mind, her choice. She goes through the chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Uh, her hair did fall out, but the cancer melted away. Her hair grew back. She sees him five years later in a restaurant. He says, Dr. Stevens, you saved my life. If you'd been one of those doctors who believe in assisted suicide, I wouldn't be here. So this was probably in the early 2000s that they had this encounter, uh, having probably done this just in the late 90s. And then she's still alive now over 20 years later. That's true compassionate care. So I'm going to stop here, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to field them. Um, or any thoughts? Um, what, what thoughts have I generated with you?
moves on. Uh, yes, Doctor. The uh, Nuremberg Code, does it have any legal basis? Because um, I understand that it's just a code and that, it, you know, uh, doctors could um, <clears throat> ignore it, politicians could ignore it, you know. The question is basically, could politics, is it just a code, it's not a, uh, it's not a law, you're absolutely right, and that's exactly why there's also a Hippocratic Oath, and it's being ignored as well. In fact, it's being derided, you know. Um, it's, it's sad that they did their best after the atrocities of the Nazi regime with respect to inhumanity to uh, Jewish people and others, homosexuals, Christians, there was no real demarcation of only those people would go to their death. So it was a code to try to get people to stop doing things like cold water under, uh, uh, cold water experiments to see how long it would take somebody in cold water to die. That was one of the experiments the Nazis took, took out. Or how do you kill people efficiently? I mean, initially they started machine gunning them, and after a while the, the gunners couldn't keep doing it. It... Um, it may have been exhilarating for some who were misguided pathologic personalities, but it wasn't after a while. And besides, they needed the bullets for the war, so they came up with gas chambers, Zyklon B gas. So it's unethical, it's immoral, it's inhumane, it's all those things, and so it's a code. You're exactly right. We're not compelled to follow it, and you see, this is what Putin's doing. He's not fighting by the Marcus of Queensberry rules. He's doing what he can do to devastate and demoralize the people because he thinks that will work. I think he's kind of shocked that actually people are actually still have some moral fiber in them. The Western countries that couldn't agree on anything seem to have come together. It may be too little too late, but by golly, he's actually solidified thought against those atrocities that are going on as we speak. Um, by the way, we all, need to, we all need to pray for peace, pray for uh, some resolution to this. Uh, we don't have more innocent lives gone. But the point you're making is exactly right. All we can do is stand for principle. And, you know, as Mother Teresa said, you know, we're, we're called to be faithful, express the truth. God is truth. We're not going to necessarily be successful. We're called to be faithful in expressing the truth. And that's our mandate here. Dr. Toffler, we have about one minute left, so perhaps one more question. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. When you said at the beginning that um, the power to euthanize is now in the doctor's hands, does that mean that the doctor can actually make that decision uh, for a patient who may be weak and hasn't been informed, given informed consent? So the question is, you know, could it happen to people who are disabled in some way, either mentally or whatever? That's exactly what's happening now in Canada. It's what's happened in, in the Netherlands for decades at this point, where you're euthanized when you never ask for it. That's the end of life without explicit request or permission. It's only a matter of time before somebody substitutes their own judgment and saying, well, this is a waste of resources. You already have that pressure sometimes in ICUs. My own dad who was a World War II veteran, fought in Vietnam, Korea, 31-year um, veteran, retired a brigadier general, uh, had multiple careers after that. So she's in, he's in St. Vincent's Hospital. My wife's in there. He's not awake, conscious, but you never know what people are hearing. And the nurse says to my late wife, why don't you just let him go? Why don't you just let him go? In other words, what is the nurse saying? His life is worthless. Why are you fighting to extend his life. Well, I know why we were doing it. I know why we won World War II. If there was a 2% chance of something working medically, my dad would take it. My mother was exactly the opposite. She said things like, why doesn't God take me? My dad would never say that. So I had to treat both my parents very differently. They'd been married 57 years. And I treated one like she wanted, and I treated him like he wanted. And that was the answer to the nurse's obnoxious question of projecting her own lack of value for my dad on my dad. And I don't want that to happen to all of you. And that's why I'm glad to accept invitations to come share what I believe is the truth about respecting life at all its stages. Hopefully this is helpful to you. Do you appreciate Dr. Toffler? Thank you.